Very good evening to everybody. We have gathered here from far and wide to celebrate a very special publication, From the Plough to the Stars, an anthology of working people's prose from contemporary Ireland. This is in fact the second volume of a pioneering set of anthologies that seek to gather working people's voices from contemporary Ireland. This has never been done before, and I am immensely proud to be part of this venture and to be here today with all of you who have contributed. This Culture Matter project is greater than just a singular publishing event. It is the first joint literary expression of working people's concerns on this scale with 49 contributors, and it was 67 contributors in the poetry volume, that has been fully embraced and supported by the trade union movement. We are therefore truly honored to have Jay Murphy, president of the ICTU, to say a few words to open this launch. Jay, please. The trade union movement does have a strong literary tradition and has long been supportive of writers and people generally seeking to communicate from a working class perspective their experiences of living in a world that in many respects places a limited value on their existence. It is work that will need to continue and when I remain in this position, I will continue to support it. Weightiness of the writing. You know, they're really short pieces, but each one is emotionally charged. They kind of get in on you. You find yourself fighting back the tears and actually not succeeding in a few of them, you know who ye are uh, for those ones. But while it would be a mistake to describe this as a pessimistic book, we can't ignore that there's a lot of hardship in here. Many of the pieces are about a world weariness, an awareness of life as something that happens to you, that transforms you, that leaves its mark on you. You know, there's certain loads. Her day off. By rights she should be taking a paddle in the waves at Dolly Mount. But no, here she was making her way to one of the dodgier estates to buy a dodgy box from an uncle of the young fella in the warehouse. She felt the piece of paper in her fist. It was limp with her sweat. She stuffed the small square paper into her side pocket. No worries, she'd remember the address. 14 Bluebell Avenue. Bluebell Avenue. Jesus knows when this place last saw bluebells. All Debbie could see were grey paths and tarmac roads. There must be some muppet in the corpo with a weird sense of humour. The more ropey the neighbourhood, the more poetic the names. Dolphin's Barn, Cherry Orchard. They made it sound like a day out in the country when really... They were good places for Scordon gear. The poetic place names and the height of speed bumps were a bit of a giveaway. Speed bumps so high. It's got the, it's got this the old fashioned great literary value of telling the truth. Um, and what's more, as, as Jerry was saying, it's got political value because of the way it foregrounds class issues in these, in the wonderful little biographies before the pieces, as, as well as the pieces themselves. I, I really think it's, a, it's such a valuable contribution to, to raising and, and valuing class consciousness at a time when it's uh, never been more sorely needed. And it's a rebuke and a challenge to the, to the mainstream literary and publishing establishment, I think, and a political challenge to their cultural power. Most of all, though, it's, it's a strange thing about a small country village. Gossip would spread on the wind like a lit fire through the heather and firs on the hills. Some things, however, seem to be beyond words. Things involving sex and abuse and rape and boys and a priest. They were things that could never be let take light. He told me he would have to inform the archdiocese, as if they didn't already know. He told me that they would have to inform the guards, as if they didn't, also didn't already know. He told me that I was brave. He told me that there were many more. He knew of some, as did I. We all knew of others. That night in Valley Mountain, the nights to come and the mornings after, mothers sat and looked at quiet men eating dinner. Fathers spent late nights in, 
Men in pubs drank silently and deeply or laughed too much. What else was there to do? What else was there to do? You find a way to survive or you find a way to die. Neither, as it happens, is a life. Thank you. Ground changing under us, our communities, you know, changing around us, never being the same again. The experience of emigration, of looking for work, the experiencing of knowing that you can never go home because it's gone. The memories of home, the experience of being unhomed, the experience of the subsequent generations of the diaspora, feeling as if you never really know where you came from and you don't really belong where you are. Powerful, powerful contributions. But, you know, I want Casey's manged, flea-infested mongrel to chase me as far as O'Dwyer's unhinged gate, mother waiting on the doorstep, smoke from a silk cut red issuing like language from her lips, father educated by the evening press crossword, my sister in casualty. I want my brothers wedged against Venetian blinds when headlocks are conversations, and my favourite dead aunt buying greasy takeaways to help my mother. I want the 22A bus to cabra rattling inside my bones, lungs wheezing inside the fumes of pullback towers. I want street signs vandalized with paint, chewing gum strewn footpaths and a wheel of spike locked to a railway fence. I want buildings of two up, two down, crow stalked chimneys, smog, heat bouncing gray mist off concrete, high rise skylines, piss-stained lanes and the stench of the low-tide liffy in my nostrils. I want the squeal of street cats mating on broken bottle-topped walls, wood chip crates of Jaffa oranges at 5 a.m. in the fruit markets, stacked like a Southsiders treehouse, high heels of fearless youth on cobstones in Smithfield, Crow Park and the Dubs defeated. I want kids skidding on amber oak leaves on O'Connell Street, the oarsman early house with watery Guinness heads, lease and strip. On New uh, for a better world, the struggle that we we face to to write well and then get published in a in a literary landscape and and an industry which is dominated by non-working class authors and non-working class publishers and non-working class themes and experiences um, and it's a it's a struggle to get our lives our experiences our our emotions and imaginings represented in stories poems memoirs and and plays i want to say thank you to jenny um, in the stove warm air and i'm still writing to you Still seeing you in every page, tripping over every cracked pavement. And I was wrong to rummage for you in the past, as I suspect you would have told me too. You see, you were never lost to me, but I had to extend my arms to Ireland and journey the choppiest of seas to taste the beauty and bitterness of a country misplaced to find you as you were both glamorous and broken and twisted and loving, sat chimney smoking in our soup pot scullery. And I never once recognized that my searching was grief. Now I see you lived in my story all along. May you always reside in my pages. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Tolling bells. Even our language has changed completely. The phrase, to bump into someone is no longer relevant. Existent words have re-emerged with specific new meeting, meanings like shielding, cocooning, self-isolating, super spreading, and the definitions are as confusing as government advice. The one positive is that I'm becoming less concerned about super spreader shedders and more worried about developing a toothache since all the dentists are closed. Even a chocolate bar is dangerous these days. It's hard to recall what days were like at BC before coronavirus. In the evenings, I can hear street bingo being called out on a PA system to families sitting in their front gardens. 
I've also had fun with friends betting on when the lockdown would be lifted. But then, of course, we argued over the actual definition of lockdown release. Did we mean full or partial, a bit like a Brazilian? At least we can laugh. And to quote Shauna Casey, that's the Irish all over. They treat a joke as a serious thing and a serious thing as a joke. based the Irish language and presented it in such a way as to make it alien from the people who should embrace it. But you know, when you look at it, our language is the identity that we can't escape from. And even when we don't realize it or recognize it, and in so many of the pieces that deal with the Irish language, it was inspiring to see the efforts made by working class people north and south of the border from the Protestant community and so on to revitalize Ireland, Irish. And it's out of those embers that that language will be saved. And that to me is a powerful thread going throughout this anthology. Not a jibri was at the Hiyat, Warshits na Hestet Shrike. They should be all a mere. Mar naru biela foil. Haru eskila foil a hanarit. Mar guru antishke emia fui halu. Damshi shed tober fear eskile. A hanik faro eske erem a gazgritche e. Do it na dini guru tartaru. Near hik she and fakul few. Hanik far slender a le. A gaz yiberus na has tech reke yet. Shaker na ik shed na teli tea. Dort na dini na ro arge der biaku, hasi shishin a geri fuifa. Dort shet groshet maru lishanakris, nir hik shan fakul fiu. Hoi shet a wala go bala er lara gebra, vi kerja na aku, a dort fastari na ro agud kerja na ik tastal wifa. Hul shet na boira, hefti shet kanimer bi o lechran fuili, a vi ik dal har muil. Dolshed is barley, a vi lintele hishkin is baye, go danik far girdle, agas hunta yerechiane. The examples I referenced are but a flavor of what this book has to offer the casual reader, and even the casual reader will find it difficult, having been admitted to the working class experience, to dismiss the many injustices, inequalities, and barriers that are still to be overcome. As I said in my foreword to the book, this anthology represents an essential element in the struggle to advance the interests of the working class. Finally. Cash money walking into his domain. He whistled. Grey tracksuit looked up. Green coat's head slowly torn side to side. He squeaked out the words. Where's that? Over there, Dino's out, said Grey tracksuit. Ah, lovely. Dean sprinted and met the twosome. Why is looking for heads? Four bags of white and two brown. Four white, two brown, sound. Then let out a call and an obese teenage jungler named Chunk came out of a garden from across the street. Looked over at Dean and nodded. A slim boy with a face like a rodent crossed with a man whose name was Rizzo. He seemed to emerge from a crack in the ground and stood a few feet away against the wall of the corner of the street's entrance. Dino said four to Rizzo and held up two fingers to Chunk. Well, he dead saw his out, lads. The junkies walked over to Rizzo and Grey Tracks, who handed the cash for the drugs. Rizzo took the money for all six bags, handed over four small rack bags of wrapped heroin, and said, Go over to him and he'll give you the bags of white, yeah? Grand nice one, pal, said Grey Tracks. The junkies walked over to Chunk and he handed the two bags to them. Deal done. They ain't watched. Business was all good. He took out his phone and put on a video of a versatile song, bopped his head to the chain, looked, talked at his joint. I went back to watch him in the street. He'd wait for half an hour, then head down to the Glimmer to meet his older cousin Robbie for a point and to talk business. The lads would keep the shop open. Your story and as quickly as possible. I loved London, continued Ellen, and the only blight was the constant worry over your mother. The baby was due in late December and I had to be there for Sarah. Ellen reached for the booties and caressed the frayed ribbons. She sniffed the frayed strands of hair one stray curl gently weaving round her little finger, the faded wool now sodden with her sobs. I made these, she said. One is a bit bigger than the other, but Sarah loved them. Sarah's little boy was born on St. Stephen's Day, so she named him after the saint. 
Little Stephen was so beautiful, but I only held him for a few minutes. What happened to him? I impatiently interrupted. Stephen, whispered Ellen. Poor little Stephen just disappeared. His cot was empty one morning. Gone to a good home, they said. Sarah had no chance to say goodbye or hold him one last time. That broke our heart and spirit. You know, Sarah never questioned the church or the nuns and their view of women, believing their denunciation was justified and her violation was her own fault. My once bright and sparky sister metamorphosed into a dull, critical and scrupulous individual. That was the mother you knew, someone who hung her head in contrition and shame, but that was not my sister Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely beautiful production. And genuinely, my preparation for this event was one of the most enjoyable uh, preparations I've ever had for an event or uh, a meeting, because this is an extremely powerful book. I mean, every individual piece of writing is powerful, but presented as it is, as an anthology, it really is a profound and moving statement, way bigger than the sum of its parts.